So good, good morning and uh, good evening, uh, whatever the time zone is around the world where you're joining us from. My name is Dr. Amy Freeman-Sanderson, um, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our second DTC educational um, webinar for 2024. So um, I'm co-moderating um, co with um, the president of DTC, so Dr. Michael Brenner is joining me um, in the co-moderation. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Cynthia uh, Pandian as well on the panel. So today our topic is harnessing in situ simulation as a quality improvement tool. I'd like to acknowledge and also thank our, educate, our unrestricted educational grants and our sponsors that support the education that really underpin the GTC's mission and vision um, about creating teams of physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, speech pathologists, patients and family, families working together to disseminate best practices to improve outcomes around tracheostomy care. So I'd like to also acknowledge the, um, the uh, traditional owners of the country which we're on. So I'm based in uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, and I'd like to pay my respect to the elders both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Um, so we like to know where everyone is joining um, from today. So um, please feel free to advance, uh, to um, pop that in the chat so we know where you're all joining us from today. So today our objectives, um, we have a, a couple that we're going to cover in this next hour. So it's going to be, um, we're going to go through uh, the utilisation of in situ simulation as a quality improvement tool. We're going to discuss the implementation of an in situ simulation, review the pearls and the pitfalls of uh, in situ simulation, and really explore that uh, with our um, all of our speakers in our panel to really I'll get to the bottom of how do we design and implement some of these things. We're going to discuss the uh, PEAK2 app and its role in in-situ simulation. As always, we really encourage you to um, be engaged in the webinar. So along the way, please pop in your questions in the Q&A um, chat, um, and we'll circle back to these. We've got um, dedicated time in our panel and question and answers. So please make sure you pop those in and I uh, will circle back to address all of those. So now to introduce you uh, uh, to the panel. So um, uh, I'm delighted that we have uh, five outstanding, uh, excellent speakers uh, uh, joining us today. So we're gonna hand over to my uh, co-moderator, Dr. Michael Brenner, uh, to give a, um, a more detailed uh, introduction to our wonderful speakers. Terrific. Well, thank you, Amy, for all of your work in orchestrating this session and uh, also to all the participants who are joining us today. We truly have a phenomenal team with us. Uh, so our first speaker is Dr. Chris Yang, who is one of the rising stars in the Global Tracheostomy Collaborative and spearheaded a lot of the work that you'll be hearing about today. She is director of the Pediatric Aerodigestive Program in Pediatric Otolaryngology Quality Assurance at Montefiore Medical Center. She's an associate professor of otorhinolaryngology, head and neck surgery and pediatrics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, as to her background, Dr. Yang received her MD at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in the honors program in medical education. She completed her residency in otolaryngology head and neck surgery at Tulane University and fellowship in pediatric otolaryngology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. She also completed a master's of science more recently in clinical research methods in Einstein in 2023. Dr. Yang's academic interests uh, include integration of healthcare simulation, implementation science and human factors to improve safety and quality for patients with tracheostomy. Uh, what I'd like to add on a more personal note is that Chris is just an incredible colleague, clinician and collaborator. She's innovative, a master of execution, and she's truly ushering in a paradigm shift in tracheostomy care. Uh, really replacing the more reactive approaches that we take of waiting for harm to happen, instead building systems and methods like in situ simulation that are transforming care. Thanks for joining us, Chris. 
And now we're going to uh, advance slides to our next speaker, uh, Bradley Schiff, uh, who's a giant in our profession and been a tremendous friend to the Global Tracheostomy Collaborative since its inception. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery. He's the director of Head and Neck Surgery for the department. He's also the director of the Head and Neck Cancer Service Line for Montefiore Einstein and a prolific clinician, educator, and scholar. After receiving his Bachelor of Arts at Wesleyan University in 1993, Dr. Schiff attended New York University School of Medicine, earning his Doctor of Medicine in 1997. His postdoctoral training began at Georgetown University Medical Center, where he completed his internship in 1998 and his otolaryngology head and neck surgery residency in 2002, acting as chief resident in his final year. He went on to complete a two-year fellowship in head and neck surgery at the renowned MD Anderson Cancer Center in 2004. And uh, Brad is just one of those people who's always shouldered more than his share of the load and gone out of his way in particular to clear the path for others. Uh, we simply would not be where we are today or as far on our journey uh, without Brad's academic generosity, his purposefulness and spirit. Uh, thanks so much, Brad, for being part of this program. And so now moving on to our third speaker, Dr. Alice Lee, she's a new face for us. She is a second year resident in otolaryngology at Montefiore Medical Center. She grew up in New York and received her medical degree at the City University of New York School of Medicine through a seven year bachelor's and MD program. And importantly, she has pursued rotations, training and clinical opportunities in underserved communities. Uh, this is a theme that pervades her work. She is interested in pursuing a career in pediatric otolaryngology, and she has an academic interest in quality improvement and the social determinants of health. She's passionate about equitable, equitable health care and hopes to take on a leadership position in the future. She's also been instrumental in our prior International Tracheostomy Symposium. Thanks so much, Alice. And number four, uh, Dr. Gina Cassell Chaudhry uh, has several leadership roles. She's director of the Pediatric Critical Care Medicine Quality and Safety Council. She's an assistant medical director of patient and safety. Uh, and she's assistant professor of pediatrics and pediatric critical care medicine at Children's Hospital at Montefiore and Montefiore Einstein. Her focus at the Children's Hospital is a multidisciplinary approach to the introduction and maintenance of quality improvement initiatives that improve patient safety. After earning her bachelor degree in 2003, Dr. Cassell Chaudhry attended the New York College of Osteopathic Medicine, receiving her Doctor of Osteopathy in 2007. She began her postgraduate training with an internship and residency at North Shore LIJ Cohen Children's Hospital from 2007 to 2010. And then she became, she took a three year fellowship in pediatric critical care, which she completed in 2013. Uh, her research involves a wide range of areas around standardization, implementation, and maintenance of guidelines to optimize patient safety. Her work has included a protocol for internal feeding of patients on high flow nasal cannula, a standardized algorithm to prevent iatrogenic drug withdrawal, and a protocol driven management of convulsive status epilecticus. Uh, she's been very prolific and shared her work through peer reviewed journals, abstracts, and presentations. And then last in our lineup, I'm delighted to present Denise Mutalip Mahia. Uh, she's a dedicated native New Yorker whose passion for healthcare has spanned over two decades. With more than 22 years of experience as a respiratory therapist in the Bronx, Denise has been an essential part of the community's healthcare team. Transitioning into the role of a clinician educator for respiratory care, Denise continues to make a profound impact by sharing her knowledge and experience with the next generation of healthcare professionals. Her commitment and dedication to improving patient outcomes makes her a highly sought after and valued leader in the field. So thank you to this wonderful team. And now I'll let you all take it away. Okay. Um, so to begin uh, with just some background, um, there's a pretty high pediatric tracheostomy complication rate. Um, in the literature, it's cited from 12.6 to 30 percent. Um, and similarly, in adult, tracheost uh, adult tracheostomy patients, there's about a 10 to 60 percent mortality rate. Um, the rate of adverse events is about 8.4 per 1,000 trach days. Uh, so patients with tracheostomies are a vulnerable population. Um, there are many preventable uh, kind of uh, harm that patients with tracheostomies get and that we see very often, such as skin breakdown, uh, mucus plugging, accidental decannulation, 
uh, bleeding from the trachostoma as well as from within uh, the trachea, as well as hypoxic brain injury and mortality. Um, the lack of knowledge and experience in tracheostomy specific care uh, definitely contributes to the high amounts of uh, mortality and morbidity in this population. So in response, um, we've really taken to heart uh, some of the tenets and the mission of the GTC um, that in order to successfully implement uh, tracheostomy QI initiatives that we must engage our multidisciplinary key stakeholder team, uh, including um, patients, families, and our um, physicians, nurses, uh, patient safety, quality improvement, leadership. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the things that um, we've used as an organizing principle uh, for um, both understanding and uh, mitigating sources of preventable harm in our system has been uh, human factors and systems engineering. Um, the SEEPS 2.0 model, um, is uh, predicated on um, the idea that uh, the system and its elements, including the persons or care team, um, tasks, uh, tools and technology, organization, internal and external environment are basically the inputs, um, which uh, then uh, drive processes and outcomes and then feedback on one another. Um, next slide. Uh, using this as um, an organizing principle, we've uh, used in-situ simulation where we're actually um, assessing real hospital teams in their actual clinical environment um, to see how teams and systems perform in high acuity, low frequency events, um, such as tracheostomy emergencies. Um, unlike uh, education and training focused uh, simulations, um, we're running it uh, as close to reality as possible um, without coaching or guidance during the actual scenario. Uh, and then we've uh, found that, that it, it effectively identifies uh, latent safety threats before they can combine to cause patient harm um, is an opportunity for um, up training and practice um, after the debrief and also a way to um, test, pilot, and implement novel protocols. Uh, one of the things that uh, we use to help debrief is um, instead of focusing on individual um, learners, um, that we capture latent safety threat systems issues and as time permits, um, allow those uh, team members who participate in the SIM to volunteer um, potential solutions. Okay. Um, so this is kind of an example of a QI program that was implemented at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore. Um, the, there's an online educational module, um, an insight to simulation, a standardization of bedside equipment, um, a bedside checklist in the NICU, as well as tracking clinical outcomes and bundle compliance. Um, and unit champions recruited from multidisciplinary area committee for the in-situ uh, simulation organization, organizing. Um, so this was uh, kind of a paper that looked at in situ to assess pediatric tracheostomy care, um, which was done over at Montefiore. Um, so this is a scenario. It's a 12-month-old 12, 12 with a tracheostomy tube that was placed about a month ago who is admitted with RSV. Um, so kind of the, uh, the scenario is the tracheostomy tube is occluded and or partially dislodged. Um, they're desaturating on the floor or if they're on the ICU, the ventilator is going off. Um, the room is set up as it would usually be for... Uh, if this patient was real and not in situ, um, and frontline healthcare provider team in an emergency response. Uh, there was a scheduled five-minute pre-brief uh, consent, as well as five-minute scenario, followed by a five- to ten-minute debrief. So, like, can deep that in, so let's stop the uh, suction in and add. Do we have saline bullets? I'd use quickly, so let's move quicker. I'll try. Can you have a
We do not have 2.5, we only have okay. three. So um, suctioning isn't working. So should we pull this one out and just We're get gonna, yeah, positioning off. isn't working. So it's a two person procedure, right? All right, so we're gonna remove that. So we're gonna make it up for business. Do we have a 2.5? We don't have a 2.5 yet. Right. Okay. So these um tracheostomy simulations are done in um areas where healthcare providers may encounter this. So it could be it's been done in the emergency room as well as on the floors, as well as in the ICU. Um, and everything is set up as it would be if it were like a normal patient who would kind of roll into the ED. Um, and as you could see in the video, there's kind of the group of healthcare workers that probably includes the primary team, any airway expert, as well as the nurses. Um, and there is an active discussion going on there. They discussed that the suction wasn't working. Um, there was a team leader in place who's kind of yelling out what's happening, desat desaturations are happening, and kind of what every person's... Um, role should be. Um, and then after the the kind of exercise is over, there's um, like a debrief session afterwards to discuss what went well, as well as what was missing and what could have been done better. Um, so this uh, just shows that kind of uh, latent, latent safety threats um, that were kind of seen in the in situ uh, simulations. Um, and it kind of just shows that the more kind of communication there is um, amongst team members, the more effective uh, the response is at making sure that kind of everything that needs to be done on the checklist is finished, as well as uh, to make sure um, anything that was missing or that could be done better is, is spoken about to prevent that in further simulations as well as in person. Um, this is kind of another table that shows kind of examples of late, latent safety threats. Um, so um, moving on to uh, how we then adapted things for the adult side. Um, so we applied a similar model of um, examining uh the latent safety threats and errors in uh, tracheostomy emergency management from the pediatric side to the adult side with um, members of our um, hospital-wide airway committee, which um, Dr. Schiff chairs. Um, and uh, an important note here is that when we were implementing things in um, both the pediatric and adult um, realms of our hospital system, that we really engaged the unit nursing and physician champions um, although many of the um, safety threats and some of our greatest concerns um, arose from uh, some of the less acute uh, and less centralized uh, parts of our hospital, uh, we purposely started a lot of our initiatives in the pediatric ICU on the um, uh, CHAM side and in the uh, surgical and medical intensive care units on the adult side, just because um, some of those areas where we were where we had the greatest um, key stakeholder engagement and it seemed like a better area to um, pilot and just kind of show proof of concept and feasibility. This is um, an adult trach scenario that had been done in situ. It's a 64 year old with a tracheostomy placed about a month ago with the history of COPD who was admitted with pneumonia. Um, and kind of like the same scenario, room is set up as it usually would be for a patient. There is an obstructed inner cannula or dislodged tracheostomy tube. Um, there are DSATs, uh, the patient's on the floor um, and kind of the same timing scheduled as with the pediatric trach scenario. Um, Going outside. Yeah, sorry, Andy. Uh, no. Um, I would okay. get start. Um, um, I would okay. get someone. What do you mean? Now you have two nurses, and I can. Okay. Uh, Morgan, what do you want? 
Oh, you should hook this up to the oxygen. Okay, it is. Okay. Yeah, I turned it on. Okay. 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 All right, now oxygen's going down. Oh, so do we can we do this? And then could someone go get a new room? If you want to hear in a room. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go run and get it. Oh, go run and get a new cannula. Well, there's a good What size is it? Oh, 7.5 millimeters. Yeah. Um say heart rate's high. Well oxygen's going up now. Um like pretend that this is a new one. Right? And then okay. what yeah. there we go. There we go. Would you need gloves with the new one? Oh yeah, I don't want to. Um, so here in this um, adult simulation, uh, there are a few things that um, can be discussed that could do better. They spoke about the inner cannula that you know someone had to run out of the room to grab. Um, there was someone who was kind of leading the uh, scenario was asking whether there was uh, resistance with the bagging, was describing kind of the oxygen status of the patient. Um, they said, oh, even though they're bagging, the saturations are going down. You um, can also see here that the tracheostomy ties are a bit loose. So if this was a patient who had a dislodged trach, a contributing factor could be something like uh, loose tracheostomy ties. Going outside. So just to add, like some of the uh, safety concerns were, um, you know, there was no clear uh, verbalization of the size of the trach. Um, ventilation was not continuously maintained. There was a lot of talking over each other. So it was hard to kind of understand what was, you know, what was needed and what were the next steps were. And there was a lack of a clear team leader, um, which was, super important in order to kind of keep the 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 control the chaos um of the scenario uh lack of ppe uh the nurses were did not have their gloves on um and then there was some confusion as to where their spare trachs were located um so we've actually mm -hmm. been able to publish some of this um, work also recently in the um, Joint Commission Journal of uh, Quality and Patient Safety, um, where we've seen that across multiple areas in the hospital, uh, we see similar themes and um, uh, patterns where um, often there's a combination of knowledge gaps and uh, either lack of equipment or um, multiple members of the team not knowing where that um, equipment is kept. Uh, or um, uh, trying to go and, and find it, and it's actually just not been um, uh, replenished. Uh, so this has helped us uh, kind of gain a lens um, and uh, display some of these uh, safety threats directly to hospital leadership and help us gain uh, resources um, and sustain those to uh, improve tracheostomy safety. Um, so we wanted to discuss um, some of the challenges and barriers that we've uh, encountered. Uh, I'd like Gina to kind of uh, start off with some of the things that we saw in our initial uh, children's hospital pilots since we started there a few years first. Sure. Um, so I think at first we had a culture where we were responding to adverse events and we were really trying to turn that around and um, provide a culture where we were uh, focusing on latent safety threats and, and focusing on preventing errors, as, as was mentioned before. Um, you know, anytime there's a QI initiative um, or anything that requires um, a change in the workflow or process, uh, culture is, you know, one of the big things. So I think this was definitely a culture change where we were 
performing these simulations at the bedside. Um, some of the barriers were just uh, nerves and, you know, some discomfort with performing in front of a team and, and um, you know, feeling embarrassed. And we really tried to create a culture uh, where we um, people felt psychologically safe. And I think that that was one of the first things that we really had to overcome um, for buy-in, for, for everyone to realize that we were a team and we were going to learn together. And there wasn't any one group or anyone you know, person that we were focusing on, um, it was supposed to be kind of a safe environment. So I think that was probably the biggest barrier at first. Um, and then regarding uh, some of the balance with patient care. Um, so we uh, follow no-go criteria pretty strictly. So um, we anticipate about a 20 to 30% cancellation or postponement rate. Um, for simulations and um, therefore schedule backup simulations, but also if there's an active code or issues with um, staffing uh, that we communicate clearly, not only a week before, day before, morning of uh, a simulation with the charge nurse and unit champions. And if it seems like it's not going to go, we don't um, try and force the activity through um, that we're pretty flexible with that. Um, furthermore, we've communicated those findings in um, the multiple um, hospital uh, quality improvement um, mechanisms, whether that's the um, uh, CHAM Pediatric Airway Committee that uh, Gina and I co-chair, or um, Brad, if you wanted to comment on some of how we've been able to move it along through the Moses Airway Committee too. Yeah, I think it's very important to just get everyone involved. If you're sitting, if, the, if, if there's one group that's not actually invested it's very hard to get the support of everybody so we through the airway committee we got leadership you know we made sure that the nursing leadership was on board and that the icus were on board and that way that there would be people where you know that, that they could tell their own department and and get them involved and i think that that's really helped move it along because at the start it was mostly chris trying to get everyone to do it. And then once everybody's, all the different departments were invested, then it became much easier to facilitate. Uh, hi, I, I'm going to uh, jump onto the, the panel as well and also at this point, ask for questions from the audience to uh, ask our panelists about all aspects of the uh, simulation. Um, in regards to the, the design and the um, implementation as well. But I wondered if you could speak to a little bit about, um, you know, that sort of uh, the design really in regards to a little bit more about getting this off the, off the ground and those elements and how you created that across the team um, and touching on those points that you mentioned, Gina, about um, psychological, psychological safety and building that up in the, uh, the scenarios. So could you tell us a little bit more about building it up and to the launch time? Sure, I think uh, Insight2 Sim in general started in the ICU um, just prior to Chris's implementation of Insight2 Treak. And so we created a script actually. Um, most of the times we run these scenarios three times a week, twice a week, they're run by our PICU fellows. And so there was a script that was created just to kind of get rid of some nerves in the beginning where it was very clear what the objectives were and very clear that this wasn't going to be um, an environment that was accusatory in any way. So I think the script really helped and people got used to hearing that. And again, we have physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, really multidisciplinary team, some of who are very used to simulation scenarios and some are not. So we knew that we were dealing with a, a diverse group. Um, I think, uh, having buy-in um, was also really successful because there was presence. And I think those who started up the Insight2 simulation program were very present for the first several months and would come to the ICU every morning um, at 7 a.m. that a simulation was going to occur to make sure that there wasn't a cancellation or, uh, you know, any, um, you know, kind of feedback from the morning that this couldn't happen for certain reasons, because it's very easy to find reasons in the ICU to cancel, um, you know, organized education because it's always going to be busy. So I think having that leadership presence and having that buy-in um, really helped get it off the ground. And now it's really 
um, to the point where anybody can be on in the ICU, any attending, any fellow, any resident, any nurse, and it will happen. And so that is really a great place to be now that we've been able to work it into our workflow at a time um, of the day that's convenient in a place where there's buy-in and, and it's been really great. So we've been pretty successful in running these three days a week now, and we started at night as well um, for probably the last four or five years. I, I think that that segues into uh, Brian Kaufman's question too. Um, what is really fantastic at Montefiore, and um, it, I think that uh, it's been really helpful for our program is that um, the uh, chief residents and critical care fellows were um, very intimately involved and remain so um, in not only the implementation, but the sustainment of the um, Intagusim QI program. Um, and that uh, the participants, as well as the leadership from um, nursing physician side, um, residency wide, um, fellowship wide, are able to help guide and give feedback on how these things run. So, um, you know, they help not only maintain and uh, give feedback on the schedule, um, but we've also maintained their trust by keeping it to 15 minutes total. Um, so it's a five minute pre-brief, five minute sim, and five to 10 minute debrief. Anyone who wants to stay and practice skills afterwards can, but people get to go back to work. Um, so I think one of the potential pitfalls, if you if you get so excited that you extend it to 30 or 45 minutes, you've locked the trust and you're not going to be able to continue the program. Um, uh, and what's really great is some of those um, residents became fellows, some of the fellows became attendings who are now part of the leadership team. Um, so we've been able to train really skilled and experienced facilitators through it. Um, then uh, some other questions. Um, Mabruk uh, Aldasari uh, mentioned about uh, working in other um, locations. And so um, we are going to touch on it a little bit and are happy to take questions and have uh, contact information later. But um, this is something that is applicable not only to inpatient settings, but um, anywhere that uh, patients with trachs are receiving care, um, that by running it uh, kind of low technology um, and uh, having all that um, information in the script, um, that you can establish a safe and easy environment to get it off the ground um, in lots of places. Um, you know, even your outpatient clinic, or if there's a place that um, people are kind of uh, handing off for transition. We've done it in ERs and floors. Um, but to start with your first couple of um, kind of more feasible places first, um, so you show that it can be done. I mean, you touched on um, you know, a couple of important points. Um, and I wanted you to speak to about that. This, uh, the multidisciplinary and the interdisciplinary um, education as well. So what in regards to scenarios, we know that multiple um, professions are being involved, um, patients and families. So yeah, I guess in terms of the, the success behind that, the pearls in regards to designing your education that would go across disciplines um, and with different groups. So can you talk to uh, sort of that and if that was a, a key driver in um, improving skills across the team as well. And any comments about that? Uh, yes. Um, so uh, the inside you simulations can have um, a couple of different purposes. So um, the ones that we run for assessment purposes are um, also intermixed with ones that are focused more on training or um, being able to uh, develop action plans that don't just focus on knowledge. Um, you know, if there's equipment issues or other things, then it feeds back to those other um, gaps. Uh, but the ways that we've been able to then tackle some of these knowledge gaps have varied. So they've been anywhere from um, you know, immediately afterwards staying behind for some of those folks, or even, you know, there's only six people or so who can participate per team. If there's 30 more people on that unit um, and they want a rolling refresher that day or later that week or park the mannequins um, with the 
um, educator for that unit, uh, coming at shift change, um, meeting people where they are. If they say that um, two o'clock works for them, then two o'clock works for them, right? We have to be able to bear some inconvenience for the um, simulation team. Um, and also having um, a team at our simulation center that's willing to come at nine, 10 o'clock at night for night shift. Um, so uh, we've tried to adapt what we can um, based upon what the stakeholders are telling us they need. Okay, great. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of that, I mean, SIM has some specific structures and you mentioned those. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit more about the, the pre-brief and post and the debrief and the importance of wrapping that around the actual SIM um, and how that supports learning um, and skills? So tell us a little bit about more about that if you can. Uh, sure. Um, so we try to stick with the script just so that everyone says it the same way every time. Um, but it starts off with um, we're recording simulation, we're recording from overhead, we're not catching your name, we're not um, uh, recording your badge, we're not going to share the um, outcome or what you share in the debrief with your boss um, or whether or not you choose to participate. People can opt out. Uh, and this is going to be five minutes. Here's the mannequin. Do you have questions before we start? And then sometimes there's a little bit of hesitance in the beginning. So we have the one line, you know, this is a 13 month old or this is a 64 year old um, with uh, a trach who's desatting, go. And then we don't really give a whole lot more than that because they wouldn't get more than that in real life before they just start and put gloves on and get in there and, and um, try not to hesitate for too long. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. And I think that adds again to that point of psychological safety in regards to the debrief, the, uh, the um, people being able to go through sort of what went well, um, what might I reflect on for um, you know for next time in terms of change as well so it's an important part of it just a, a couple of other questions that are coming um, from the audience and that's you've described some um, situations where you are doing sim so what about um, do these extend to um, part of training as uh, with families as a part of discharge education can you uh, just uh, speak to um, the, what you do with sim with families or your plans uh, sure. So we're actually developing a couple of our, um, resources, and we'll we'll go to that next. Um, both that uh, we hope can help equip you to get these things off the ground yourself, um, as well as um, some online resources with some collaborators at uh, Yale uh, called Simbox, um, which uh, we're not only reviewing with patients' families, inviting them um, to provide some of the video content, so they're not just staring at a static mannequin, but maybe their own you know, child who's volunteered to be um, the movie star for the day. Um, uh, and then it, it certainly can be applied um, for the dry run of um, patients and families getting ready to go home. We're going to be piloting it in, in rehab, although we've um, so far really focused on um, the in-hospital. Uh, we think that it, it is very portable. Um, we can go to the next slide, Alice. Uh, so uh, we've um, partnered with uh, several uh, experts in both um, tracheostomy and airway care, as well as in simulation, to develop um, this pediatric tracheostomy emergency readiness tool published in Laryngoscope last year, and have adapted some of the task-specific items on the left, uh, next slide, um, to an app. Um, so uh, we've uh, been able to work with the Inspire um, simulation investigators. Um, and uh, specifically with PEAK2, um, which has, as you see in the screen here, developed a couple of scenarios, including uh, for acute respiratory compromise with bag mouth, mass ventilation and tracheostomy to be able to not only identify if um, there are uh, tasks that are happening, but how quickly they're happening um, to try and benchmark like what is good and effective and swift performance um, versus where 
um, teams and systems might need some work. Um, we're also very excited, uh, you can keep on the adult one, um, that uh, we're starting to do the same for adult where we've added um, an item for intercannula also. Um, and so uh, we're um, excited and, and later on we'll um, share some of our information if you like to try to use this at your own institution. So you'll have um, access to the app, the scripts, um, and the scenarios. So you're not having to um, build this from scratch. Okay. Uh, next. So, you know, I think that, that something move closer, that what Chris has really done here has been fantastic. And at first I was a little skeptical, to be honest. She was the one who really spearheaded this, that it was going to work. But I've seen it work and I've seen her get the buy-in and I've seen how it really has improved people's comfort. And I think that uh, it's been very effective here. And I think it, it, it would be very effective in many institutions. And I think one of the keys is you just you can't do it on your own or you're not going to have the feedback. It has to be a teamwork. You have to get people from the other, from every discipline who's going to be there involved and engaged because that's how they're going to sell it to their contemporaries. And if you don't do that, I think it's really an uphill battle. I mean, if you maybe different hospitals are different, but I think here really that made a huge difference. And I think it's it's a great way that you, you know, with the with what is happening with the peak where you can use technology and this is not a static thing and you can constantly improve your stimulation by using different technologies and new technologies. And um we're happy to take any questions and thank you very much for having us here. Thank, thank you so much for presenting that enormous body of work um, across the team and um, in regards to the, the lead up and how that is implemented and sustained. I mean, there's been um, many, uh, many things to get through to that stage. So congratulations and thank you for sharing that. Um, I think it's mm -hmm. great it, we've got this opportunity to extend some of these uh, questions uh, for the team. So specifically about buy-in, um, in terms of how people, uh, what, I guess who um, else can be involved in buy-in, what supports would help in regards to advancing programs and setting this up. So any specific advice there? Um, we've had a question from the audience. So who would be your key stakeholders for buy-in, reflecting back on your program? Um, Brad and, and Gina. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, the, the main thing was, you know, this was, Chris's idea. And when you first, if you first take it to a unit and you're like, you have to stop working for 15 minutes and do this training, people are going to be a little bit skeptical. So I think it's very helpful to have, you know, you have to have nursing leadership. One, they have to be willing to have their nurses take 15 minutes off and the respiratory therapist has to take 15 minutes off. And while you're doing this, you're not actually getting work done. And so it's, it was, a lot of it came, I think, during we, where we have this airway, we have this airway, airway committee where we meet every couple months and it's members of every discipline who's there. And so it was brought up there and there then there were sort of champions from each discipline that helped. And that's, I think that that was the real key is to get people involved from every discipline who were invested in this. And then I think that once people did it and, you know, it also has to I think they found that it was useful. And that's why I think it's it's snowballed and we're getting, there's more involvement now than there was at the start because people see the benefit. Yes, for sure. Um, you know, through, through my uh, travels in the hospital um, on the adult side, from the ICUs to the floors. And now um, most recent, I did uh, some education for the um, ED. And they were, I mentioned some of the simulations that we had um, and, and the scenarios that had happened. And they were, you know, totally invested in, you know, bringing it to their nurses and, and their department. So it seems like, you know, with the more um, exposure and, and, and stuff that happens that everybody's on board. So it, it's, a, it's a great, you know, tool to have. 
And I mean, really spoke about those elements of sponsorship and buy-in. So having that sponsorship from um, executive members and also the team as well, that this was something useful and beneficial um, and that implementation of, of time as well, having it short that it could be, uh, people could attend. Just in terms of participation though, initially I've got another question from the chat. Was, is this um, mandatory or voluntary? Um, and was that different across the professions? Could you talk to that a little bit? Gina, you wanna take it first? Sure. Um... I think for our Insight to Sim, we try to make it as mandatory as possible in a gentle way. We really encourage people to participate. Um, I think once you say it's optional, you kind of lose the group because, again, we do this early in the morning and people are trying to get um, hand off and see their patients and do other things. So I, for the trainees and the house staff, we absolutely wait for them. It's uh, multiple residents and uh, two fellows, usually on the unit at a time, um, a pharmacist who joins us as well, and then the nurses and respiratory therapists. So we do make it um, mandatory. There, there are always exceptions, but we we don't really leave it as an optional. We kind of call overhead that, you know, Insight 2 Sim is starting. Then can the team please come? And it, we have two teams in the ICU at all times. We, so one of the teams will work on the inside to sim while the other is around. So if there is an emergency, or there is something going on, we kind of try to stress that there are other people in the unit who will take care of it. This is really kind of a, as protective as you can be while you're in the ICU for education. Yeah, it's really a terrific point that you make, Gina, and a wonderful question because mandatory, it has kind of this pejorative connotation like it's a negative thing. But my experience has been that when I'm working with trainees or learners or healthcare professionals that have roles, when you make it mandatory, they like that because it makes it protected. It basically unburdens them from some of those other responsibilities and it, you know, and it gives it weight and authority. So I think your approach has been really thoughtful. Uh, one thing that's been really interesting to me always is seeing how we go about not only sustaining, but also scaling efforts. And I was wondering if you could share some of your efforts, maybe, well, anyone on the team, but I know Gina, you've scaled some of the insight to uh, work with simulation in the context of ICU. And, and Chris, I know that, that you've actually spearheaded a, a multi-institutional effort to try to disseminate this work. So any, any wisdom, both uh, within your own space as well as uh, at other institutions on, on that journey? I think um, like all QI, just kind of start small. So you could start in one unit with one team on one day, you know, one shift and, and kind of get a sense of where everybody is. We're very lucky in that we have a lot of leadership buy-in related to quality. And so um, there tends to be, like we we're talking about executive leadership, but also uh, leadership on the unit, which is really important. And so we decided we were going to start in the ICU because of multiple you know, variables that worked for us. Um, we had already been doing simulation and we had you know, the equipment and we had nursing expertise and we had people who were comfortable with debriefing, et cetera. And then we expanded it. And so we really tested it out for a while and then we expanded to the floors. And again, like we tried not to overwhelm anybody. We said, we're going to work with educators. We're going to work with ICU members who have seen this happen before. And so we took our expertise and moved it to another unit on a small scale again, one day a month with, you know, certain members of the team. So I think just starting small, seeing what's working, seeing what's not reevaluating constantly and getting feedback from the bedside providers or the, the active participants is really important because if there's something that people are really uncomfortable with or really unhappy with, that is going to, you know, kind of follow the, the simulation throughout the hospital. So now we've been lucky enough to do this in the ICUs, the floors, um, ED, NICU, and it's really kind of taken off. But I think that was our original approach to start with that small group and, and take lessons learned from there. And then regarding the uh, multi-institutional work. So right now we um, are very excited, very fortunate. We have um, 20 pediatric hospitals who are signed on for um, the PEEP2 study of which um, six, no, seven so far have conducted the pediatric trach sims. And so we're certainly inviting you to join um, this network and excited that um, we're expanding beyond pediatrics. Um, so, uh, we started with a couple of hospitals that already have pretty robust simulation programs, but 
purposely built the scenario out and tried to pro provide enough resources that you don't need more than one or two people, probably one um, running the vitals and the other uh, facilitating the simulation uh, to actually get it off the ground. Um, and then for the team, you do want it to be multidisciplinary. Um, so not all nurses, not all physicians, but a minimum of two nurses in one position with a maximum of six and to minimize crowding um, uh, for psychological safety, but also realism. So we don't want 50 people in the hallway watching. They can participate next time or we can run a second or third team um, during that same shift change. And for our international viewership, are you recruiting uh, hospitals uh, primarily in the United States initially, I imagine, or are you open to uh, going beyond U.S. borders? Uh, we are open to international. Uh, I think that Starship is actually already on um, the, the peak uh, network. Uh, and then we, we try to, similar to this webinar, um, schedule some of our meetings so that they aren't at um, an inconvenient time for folks in other hemispheres. Um, thank you, Chris and Dean, for such a phenomenal talk and really sharing your experience in developing and implementing the QI initiative. Uh, when we tried to implement uh, such insider scenarios, uh, some of the challenges that we came across was in terms of anxiety and fear of making mistakes in front of others. Um, and I think one of the um, psychologically um, affected scenario was when they came in and they didn't know that it was a insight to scenario. They thought it was a real patient. And so they were really caught up and um, overwhelmed. Um, how do you ensure that simulation sessions are conducted in a psychologically safe environment where participants are feeling comfortable making mistakes and learning from them? Uh, so a lot of it is the script and then a lot of it is tone. And I think that it's incredibly helpful when the person facilitating the simulation is not the division chief or director or someone's direct boss. Um, so I think there's actually a lot more safety that comes in from us being otolaryngologists coming into a critical care setting um, or the critical care attending who's always very accessible, but not the division chief running um, the, the simulations. And um, we often specifically recruit um, people who are skeptics. Um, so the veteran nurse who thinks that simulation is just gonna be a waste of her time and one more thing on her plate, who then experiences it, debriefs and wants to do it again, um, is your best ally. Um, I agree with that debriefing component because once the scenario is over, I know you you are really having a tight time of 15 minutes trying to get through it. But in my from my experience, there have been times where you may need to spend more than that <clears throat> last five minutes to really help them to um, accept what happened and really um, pull themselves together. So. It's, and sometimes it's not just that scenario, we've also have had to follow up with them and address some of those uh, training concerns as well. So I'm assuming you have similar experience as well. Uh, yes, precisely. And that we can't solve everything in 15 minutes. We can identify things and invite some solutions and then we have an action plan and we come back. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that sort of leads into the, the question following on from um, Cynthia in regards to um, the question from Michael. So once um, the simulation is complete, does the debrief cover what's best practice? So do you speak to this is what happened, this is sort of ideal um, in terms of uh, you know, skills or um, processes? Um, so as, as time permits, and certainly we want to um, correct or point out anything that's um, clearly urgent, um, such as when we've seen a lot of teams not remove a non-functional tube or try and occlude one that's still in the neck, but not in the trachea um, and identify that's why they're not um, successfully ventilating um, or just not replacing the intercannula at all with these new Shiley's. 
Um, but it's also kind of reporting back to the group at large about some of the things that we've observed and trying to figure out a plan for um, kind of widespread addressing um, knowledge issues, equipment issues, um, you know, culture or environment things such as people feeling comfortable to speak up, um, particularly the non-physicians um, feeling empowered. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's sort of multiple elements to, to doing the theme that you've really highlighted in your presentation. Um, so all the work behind the, the design, the setup, um, but the buy-in in terms of the support and the ongoing um, sort of structure around, you know, teams sort of being involved and people continuing that as well while maintaining patient care. So, you know, I'd like to thank all of you uh, again for all of your um, time, um, not only today, but also um, acknowledging all the time in the preparation for this lead up um, to this webinar. It's fantastic um, hearing about this work and your generosity in sharing as well um, and really building that network of you know, high quality SIM um, and looking at, at results and outcomes to really improve how we provide care um, and how we get those best outcomes. So um, thank you for all of your efforts. Um, I would like to um, call out just in terms of our third uh, webinar, so it is in the planning. So just to make sure everyone in the audience mark their calendar, it's uh, August the 1st. And to find out more about our um, the GTC collaborative and also to access um, resources, training, please visit our website. Uh, it's listed there and also um, noting our YouTube channel where all the presentations uh, are, are uploaded so they're all accessible um, and they're for you to view and access. Um, so please make sure you pass on those links to your colleagues. And just to the, the next slide, so in terms of what I wanted to also highlight is we have our International uh, Tracheostomy Symposium. Next slide, Alex. So just we have our, our Tracheostomy Symposium. So just to um, shout out that is our, our wonderful and really well attended um, symposium where it really brings together uh, people across the globe. So looking at really at a high patient and family engagement and our healthcare providers. So our uh, symposium um, this year, the eighth one, it will be held on November the 1st to 2nd, and it's virtual. So really um, making this accessible for attendance. Now is the time to uh, put in your abstract to share the work, um, the research, the uh, quality improvement, the education um, that you're doing. We really want to uh, share this um, information as a community. So please go ahead and um, submit your work and abstract the, the uh, extension. Uh, the closing date is May the 15th. So um, there's still a few more weeks to get that in. So I would encourage you to go ahead and do that. Uh, and you'll see more coming out uh, once we're closer to November in how you register um, to attend that symposium at the end of the year. So that sort of really draws uh, to the end our webinar for today. Uh, thank you again to the panel uh, and, of course, the, the audience as well, your participation. Um, we really value your time that you've um, spent listening and, um, to, you know, enhancing your knowledge around tracheostomy care. So, uh, as always, we're um, delighted to hear from you. So, um, please do get in touch with us with any um, sort of ideas or feedback or anything else that you might like um, to see in the education program. So. With that, I hope you have a good night or a good morning uh, wherever you are in the world. So thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you again in August.